Immunoglycosides are used for severe infections, particularly those that are caused by gram-negative aerobic organisms such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Aminoglycosides are indicated for severe sepsis as well as biliary and intra-abdominal sepsis and can also be used to treat endocarditis as well as complicated urinary tract infections and pyelonephritis. Aminoglycosides lack activity against streptococci as well as anaerobes and therefore they have to be combined with other antibacterial agents when the bacteria causing the infection is unknown. Aminoglycosides work by binding to bacterial ribosomes, particularly the 30S subunit, and inhibit protein synthesis. In this way, they are bactericidal and work by killing the bacteria, rather than inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. The spectrum of activity includes gram-negative aerobic bacteria, staphylococci, as well as mycobacteria. Aminoglycosides enter bacteria using oxygen-dependent transport systems these transport systems are not found on streptococci as well as anaerobes and therefore they are innately resistant to aminoglycosides. The most important side effects to remember for aminoglycosides is nephrotoxicity, so damage to the kidneys, as well as ototoxicity, so damage to hearing. Aminoglycosides have the ability to accumulate in renal tubular epithelial cells. They also have the ability to accumulate in vestibular and cochlear hair cells and then they trigger apoptosis and eventually death. Nephrotoxicity associated with aminoglycosides usually presents as a reduced urine output, and this is often reversible. With regards to autotoxicity, this will usually present after the acute infection has resolved. Patients may complain of hearing loss as well as ringing in the ears, which is also known as tinnitus. Autotoxicity with regards to aminoglycosides may be irreversible. Autotoxicity with aminoglycosides is more likely to occur when it is co-prescribed with furosemide, a loop diuretic, or vancomycin. Nephrotoxicity is more likely to occur when it's co-prescribed with a cephalosporin or vancomycin. Aminoglycosides can impair neuromuscular transmission and therefore they should not be given to patients with myasthenia gravis unless absolutely necessary. Aminoglycosides are highly polarized and therefore they cannot cross lipid membranes and should not be given orally. The dose of gentamicin, an example of an aminoglycoside, is usually based on the patient's weight as well as the renal function. Aminoglycosides also require therapeutic drug monitoring to ensure they are in a therapeutic range. When prescribing aminoglycosides, it's very important to counsel patients to report any ringing in the ears or any hearing loss, as this may indicate autotoxicity. Like with any other antibiotic, to ensure aminoglycosides are effective, you'd be looking at the patient's symptoms, for example, if they're experiencing pyrexia, as well as any blood inflammatory markers. And these would include the CRP and the white blood cell count. It's very important to follow local guidelines when dosing aminoglycosides, as the dosing may vary. The plasma drug concentration of aminoglycosides is usually measured after 18 to 24 hours after the first dose, and this would be called the trough level. When monitoring plasma drug concentrations, if the levels are too high, the next dose may be held until it's appropriate to restart the antibiotic. In patients that are obese, it's very important to use the ideal body weight rather than the actual body weight to avoid overdosing. So this summarizes the antibiotic class of aminoglycosides and I hope you found it helpful.